welcome to the sixth keynote session that day of our conference to the Roblox. Uh, at present, we have the honor to have with us uh, George Alexander, one of the, as Ellen Black noted, one of the two individuals that first came up with the whole uh, project. Uh, presented against this paper, I can go on, I'll go on. The Ruses of Art in the Age of Walls and Borders. Now, George Alexander, uh, no, could be impressive version, has worked as a coordinator of contemporary art programs at the Art Gallery of New South Wales between 1997 and 2010. He's currently for the Australian desk editor of Asia Pacific. He's been the editor and advisory advisor editor for many Australian journals. Uh, his work has been translated in French, Italian, Russian, and German. Uh, many literary works, amongst them include The Book of the Dead, Sparagnos, Motu Divide, Slow Burn, and a long poem based on Yanis Ritzos and Heinrich Schliemann, and by the Dead Travel Past. So we think if I did have show this, I have the honor of making the prologue. It's another lean project. Uh, um, margins of Time, back in 2009. And uh, his latest book is a graphic novel and it has been published recently in 2012. Now, with no further ado, I would like to uh, welcome George Alexander. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nicola. Um, Yamas e viva pantalla. Um, now, one of the least appealing parts of doing one of these keynotes um, is the constant opportunity to, to sound stupid in public. Um, those of you who sound stupid uh, only in private contexts may now count your blessings. <laughs> um, thanks Helene and Yanis, of course, for their philoxenia, that love of strangers that is the uh, welcoming Greek cultural code, along with Covendes and Calipare, you know, <laughs> the way in which they provide cheese, bread, books, wine, at the drop of a hat. Um, and for in my experience, it's um, whether you visit a Greek house or a Turkish house, an Arabic or a Persian one, whether it's a Bedouin in a tent or a millionaire in a villa, um, the details of welcome and hospitality are always the same and, and have an almost religious importance. In ancient Greek, uh, the word stranger and guest are synonymous. Um, a spoonful of jam, quince, grapes, morello, cherries, or mastica or rose leaves, or oriental coffee, or traditionally a smoke from a long pipe, a tibuk or a marielle, all good stuff and uh, all, always very what it was. Whereas meanness, um, that lack of hospitality, especially among the village Greeks, uh, is the worst possible crime. Um, I was lucky enough with uh, Phil George uh, to work in the village of Omodos in the bakery uh, where we made that table. And, um, and, and there, the, you know, the welcome was really fantastic. Even they, they didn't have a clue what the hell we were doing. Um, they were very welcoming. Um, and it reminds me that um, with all the talk of the economy and, uh, and so on, that uh, what we have here is part of a gift economy. Uh, we give a paper or we donate a kidney. Sometimes I can't tell which is which. Um, and art, as well as being a commodity, is um, really... Um, in that deliberately impersonal and rather pitiless market economy is also part of a gift economy and I think that's something we need to remember. The whole purpose of the gift economy is always to establish and strengthen the relations, uh, relationships between us to connect us to one another. When gifts circulate within a group, their commerce leads a series of in interconnected uh, relationships and, uh, and there's a lovely kind of uh, decentralized <coughs> cohesiveness that emerges. And, um, it's one of the things that have been uh, that's puzzled me for a long time is how we make a community, and um, and our yearning for a community and um, and our failure at making communities. Sometimes uh, I'm less persuaded by the communities organised socially by politics, um, like some club with exclusive membership, whether it's the Golden Dawn or some of the other ideological parties that uh, that have been judged by history. I think, um, and. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in some way, I'd say, a Groucho Marxist, uh, you know, as he said famously, that uh, I'd never be, you know, I'd never join a club that, that would have me as a, as a member. And I think that's, that's a good way to put it. Um, but we're here to talk a little bit about um, uh, politics and, and art and to examine the tension in some ways between them. Um, 
with all the Biennales of Taipei, uh, Sharjah, and Sydney, and uh, Istanbul, um, there's this attempt to contextualize our practice um, in terms of these crises. Um, and so before I go any further with that, I'd like to point out that I see, I think, with Raymond Williams, um, that activ activists locate praxis in organization, uh, and artists locate praxis in awareness. Okay. Um, the title I gave my talk, um, as Nicholas pointed out, um, in faraway Australia, um, was I can't go on, I'll go on. Um, coming from Australia, you know, makes the world around a place. Um, um, I think the 20th century will be neither an American century nor a Chinese one. It will be a world century and uh, it will belong to all of us or to no one and we must decide together how to shape it. So, I can't go on, I'll go on comes from, uh, of course, uh, that bleak Irishman, uh, Beckett, with his existential paradox. But it links also in my mind to Gramsci's um, uh, pessimism of the intellect, uh, optimism of the will, which uh, was mentioned the other day. Um, and it offers, a, I think, a kind of metaphor for our situation now. I feel that we're sitting on a, a kind of a comma, a pause between I can't go on and I'll go on. Um, it also brings to mind um, that, uh, that, that rather hilarious uh, Italian-American uh, baseball player called Yogi Berra, who says, when you arrive at a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> it's a rather baffling instruction. <laughs> uh, I was also pleased to research when I, uh, when I was doing this paper that the fork in fact came from Cyprus. And um, indeed, uh, it was introduced into Europe by Peter I, who took forks with him to Poland in 1364. So, it was the Congress of Kings, and in a way it was one of the very first, or an early version, of the Ye EU summit. Uh, in Krakow, of, of all places. So there you go. I think there's a lot of other Eurosceptics who um, still like to eat only with a knife. Now, between walls and borders was the, was the particular um, topic for this, this afternoon session. And walls, of course, there's Wall Street and there's the Wailing Wall, there's the walls of Jericho and the Great Wall of China. Um, and things can get so frustrating we might as well be talking to the walls or climbing up them. We can um, be driven up a wall and go crazy. Many poor people have been pushed to the wall or have their backs to the wall. Those marginalized, pushed aside, are sent to the wall. Um, and uh, those dying have their face to the wall. What's more, we all bring the walls and borders of the villages we come from, theoretical or geographic or ideological or psychological, when we arrive at the crossroads of the big city, the conference, or the forum. <coughs> of course, the only walls that are being pulled down uh, of these days are the ones that protect the poor. Um, it's a crazy time. The ATMs have no money, the housing officer has no housing, the employment office has no employment, the welfare workers have no welfare, and yet the military has plenty of guns, the drug squad has uh, loads of drugs, the <laughs> refugees have lots of refugees. Off the coast of Australia, asylum seekers are left to die of thirst and hunger, even after the disabled boats has been spotted uh, from a helicopter and several ships, including an aircraft carrier. In our, in our TV democracies, um, so more walls there. Um, in our TV democracies, the media is parochial. The politicians are parochial. They are forced to think narrow. Our own Prime Minister doesn't know whether we are fighting in, or at, or for Afghanistan. What preposition do we use for a place like Afghanistan? So the world seems like this, you know, it reminds me of this, I have this vision of a kind of a skeletal dog that's lying flat in the dirt. It's alive with fleas, it scratches here, Somalia, it scratches there, Syria, it scratches elsewhere, North Korea. The fleas catch your attention, and like fleas they also elude you. And it seems um, that there are more and more things that you can do less and less about. The scale and the complexity of the problems require solutions that leave you, me, uh, bewildered. The sheer chaos of the big P political situation, the ruthlessness of a, uh, a global market economy, and the financialization of capital that we, we hear so much about. Uh, it's, it's very interesting because it doesn't utilize the worker. 
while as uh, as Stretchko pointed out the other night, the, um, the right wing is co-opting the workerist uh, discourse. Um, in a way, also um, the uh, the indebted white collar worker. I mean, middle class teachers and academics uh, like ourselves, intellectuals, or dropouts from the middle classes. Um, um, we also um, are sort of uh, worried about our superannuation. You know, if you have money put aside, uh, which is the way they do things in, in, in Australia, you work, you put a little bit of money aside so you're not a burden to the government further down the track. And then they invest your money in these fluctuating global uh, global shares. So, uh, so in, in a sense, what they're doing is neutralizing that worker versus the state situation as well in your, your kind of stuff. Um, and so all politics seems to do is to rearrange the patterns of scarcity. Uh, Republican, Democrat, Labor, Conservative, uh, or, you know, our party systems are, are locked in a kind of left-right, uh, 180 degree affair. They look like they're ordering, they look like they're ordering these opposing forces, action and reaction. Um, but in fact, they're creating them like, like a blueprint um, creates uh, the house. It's Manichaean. Um, it's like Robert Mitchum with uh, love uh, tattooed on one hand and hate on the other. It's, um, and um, power, we know, corrupts. Uh, so we replace one mafia uh, with another potentially criminal thing. So capital P politics feels as if it's dead, like it's a fantasy. Uh, I have a very strong feeling, and I have had for a long time, that you could put all the politicians in a spaceship and send them to Mars, and, um, and basically, the, the affairs on Earth would, wouldn't change too much. Maybe they'd improve. But if you put workers, you know, like uh, like telephone repairmen or flight controllers or, or, or electricians or bakers, uh, then you'd have misery and starvation. Politics, and I'm sure uh, all of you feel this as well, uh, feels like a behind-the-scenes negotiations by elites and experts. Politics is meta-theater. It's uh, like a bad Tennessee Williams play. Um, Politics has become showbiz for ugly people. Meanwhile, of course, capital exists, exploitation exists, inequality exists, oppression continues. The politicians won't save us. It's not in their power. All we all we can hope is that they they keep from um, that we keep them from destroying us. Now, I, I I don't know what to do, and I have no solutions. I just have points of departure. Raiders, uh, who uh, probably expresses the roadblock scenes uh, very clearly. Now, this work is um, uh, in the next section. I'll talk a little bit about art and the spectator, and I think it, it connects with uh, Lanfranco's uh, lecture this morning in some respects. Um, this installed work uh, is right next door uh, to an outdoor restaurant. It's in Canberra, the art gallery uh, there, the National Gallery. And so as you sit there eating or, 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 um, or, or sipping your coffee, you look down at these disembodied heads. Um, the work is by Dadang Cristanto. He's an Indonesian-born uh, artist who lives in Darwin, in Australia, in North Australia. And he works against uh, the backdrop of uh, 1960s army-sponsored terror and murder in Indonesia of the failed communist coup of 1965. Um, that's uh, Dadang there uh, setting it up. And, uh, and from another work. Um, so it's a, it's a very splintering experience as you sit there and you, you know, you're eating in the gallery. Um, and, and I'm involved, not just as a spectator, but I'm wondering about my own complacency. I'm sipping my coffee in the face of this daily brutality and injustice. Um, I feel a sense of powerlessness um, in Cristanto's work. And, and it also stems, in fact, from his own uh, helplessness as a child, he, he actually watched his father being uh, dragged away uh, by soldiers uh, from the family home. So there's memory of a personal and collective trauma here driving us. Um, that's another one. Uh, that's actually in the art gallery of New South Wales where I used to work. Um, so um, it seems to be that um, much of, uh, I mean, much of life is, uh, is turning us into consumers, and, and no matter how unsettling the experiences, we, we tend to consume them in a sense. It's a form of consumption. Um, being part of a global audience um, can have this neutralizing effect on, on uh, reportage. 
and, uh, and, and <coughs> the catatonic gaze of the television. Um, it seems, as, as, as one old Eskimo once put it when they introduced television uh, up there, says that it gives us everything and nothing. It leaves us overexcited and bored. And, um, and it's something that I think observers of, of, of cinema have found out how movies allow us to be mechanically absent uh, or, of bringing about a defeat of our presence. We can, we can offer no, no input. We are invisible and inaudible to the actors. I do nothing in the face of tragedy. My helplessness is assured. Um, so, I mean, Guy Debord, of course, talk, talked about the spectacle, this sort of pseudo world of technical mediations uh, that supports the capital system. And the way you know, our efforts at creating a community really uh, end up as this sort of atomized mass of watchers and appearers. And, um, and, and even reality, after a while, of uh, too much television. Um, uh, makes makes it feel like a, a, a TV rerun, you know, in the sense of it being a little bit unreal. Is it possible still to be moved? Um, and I mean, this this picture here, which is, is sort of so desolating, um, and yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's it's part of this sort of sense of you're looking at an Andreas Gursky uh, photograph, you know, slightly hyper real, um, with a fading fading sense of what is real anymore. Um, but but this, I think, because we're, we're positioned behind this man in this extraordinary silhouette, um, it, it really does feel like a bad dream. You know, what's going on here? Why am I here? And this sort of uh, dissociation uh, and lack of affect uh, within ourselves, I can often wonder, uh, just mentioning Gursky, that there's a sort of postmodern, I mean, this period from, from Warhol to Kearns and, and a little bit beyond into the 90s, of a sort of disaffected nonchalance, a kind of a laminated experience, you know, Teflon things, things kind of rub off. You can't internally process any images anymore. You can't, you can't internally rework them. Um, so I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to come to terms with is, is this sort of numbness and our need sometimes to numb ourselves. Um, uh, but, but how much, you know, how much should we, we, we be feeling? And there's a, I mean, uh, the familiar term is, compassion fatigue, um, and how do we, and I think this was the, the, the gist of some of uh, Lang Franco's talk this morning, was, it was about trying to figure out, figure out a, a compassionate ethics um, between a sort of emotional contag contagion of the mass on the one hand, individual pity on the other, and in between a sort of empathy, an empathy that works, uh, for example, in, 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 you know, in photographs or in, or in art, an internal resonance resonance, a, sim a, a sympathy of the suffering with <coughs> that we talk about. Okay. Um, uh, during the 9-11 attacks in uh, New York City, there's a magnet photographer, his name is Thomas Hutka. He shot this photograph of a, a group of people you know, casually enjoying themselves at so it seems while the uh, World Trade Center burns. Um, he kept this image under wraps for about four years and then he produced it in a book in 2006. It caused a bit of a a bit of a stir because there's this dreadful contrast between the glorious sky, you know, this kind of rather casual dress of the students, uh, you know, almost uh, picking. Um, and yet, you know, of course, it's quite plausible that while you know this tragedy is taking place, they are sort of taking it in, you know, and, uh, and, and we don't really have any information about, about them and uh, so on. So there's a sort of sense of, of, of again spectatorship rendering. Um, uh, whatever's happening uh, continue. Um, but the, the writer Alberto Manuel spoke about um, how during the World Trade Center crash there was a guy who uh, wandered um, uh, into a bookshop in order to get away from the, the glowing dust and then sat down and, and read until obviously the, the whole business was over. And way back, uh, Chateaubriand apparently noted that during the French Revolution, a Breton poet had just arrived in Paris. Um, uh, to be taken to Versailles. So there are people uh, who, in the midst of the collapses of empire, visit fountains, visit fountains and gardens. Uh, I was also rather reminded of the, these characters in Boccaccio uh, in the Decameron. Uh, they've got their backs to the Black Plague, which is taking taking place uh, in the meantime. Um, and they, you know, the bodies are piling up. The funeral rites 
for being ignored. And um, they go to a country house uh, some two miles from the city to spend 10 days storytelling. It's interesting that Boccaccio was mentioned twice, uh, once by a spiller. Um, anyway, and also um, there's this, um, of course, a painting uh, by, uh, by Bruegel, um, who lived in the first half of the 16th century in Belgium. Uh, and an English poem by by um, by uh, W. H. Auden called Musée de Beaux Arts, and it goes a little bit like this. Um, now, if you look carefully uh, down in the right-hand corner, you'll see two little legs, and I'm sure many of you you know the picture. About suffering, they were never wrong. The old masters, how well they understood its human position, how it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking daily along. That even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course. Anyhow, in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturous horse scratches its innocent behind. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away, um, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. Uh, the plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive delicate ship um, that must have seen something amazing a boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to go and sailed calmly on so this is a poem really about about the way um, there's this disturbing discrepancy really between um, uh, acute suffering and, and hum drum life you know there's a tragedy, but ooh, la dear, but day life goes on. Two events side by side in the same circle of human existence. And, um, and that sort of worrying, asymmetrical uh, feeling between the tragedy unfolding and you there and the intractable ongoing, ongoingness of life. I mean, that's a tragedy, but there's also a kind of comedy to it as well. Um, I don't know, again, it's uh, one of those dark uh, jokes that um, that are told. There's a story of a, of, of a guy who knocks on a house and and this uh, woman comes to, to the door, but she's crying. And um, he says, oh, is everything all right? Is Bill here? And she says, no, no, Bill died last night. And he said, oh, did he say anything about a pot of paint? <laughs> <laughs> um, life goes on. Um, but if we cannot understand about the, the precariousness of life, uh, says Judith Butler, we cannot grieve, we cannot save a life. Uh, something awakens in us um, uh, that pain, uh, uh, that need to suffer with. Um, in Iri and Jaya in Papua New Guinea, um, a, a woman will chop off a finger if she loses a child or, or, or a lover. Um, and the brotherhood of, of, of you know, Gandhi or Che, Guevara, you know, who relinquish their comforts uh, to take on the suffering of the masses. Uh, those people, who, those doctors and nurses who uh, rush off to refugee camps, always amazing. Um, and I, I don't know, no brain power, no, uh, no theory, no high altitude theory, no political or class analysis really uh, can come to grips, I think, with some things, uh, when, especially when you're before those who are up against the wall at the limit of their destitu destitution. Um, I think I've got these things in the wrong order. Did I miss out something? Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Uh, and I, I want to bring uh, bring us forward into 2011 in February and the plight of 300 North African sans papier who occupied a building in Athens and went on a hunger strike. And it was a catalyst for the uh, 200,000 indignados in Sintagma Square. The, uh, um, I can never say Abenak is many, um, which which uh, uh, which spilled out onto a syntagma on the following May, 1925. Now, these are people who you know uh, lived in Greece for about 10 years. They did all the shit jobs. You know they they uh, they cleaned the toilets. They worked on the building sites. They picked the oranges and uh, the olives, and uh, they you know they got paid <coughs> half the amount. Um, um, but at certain points of the you know the uh, the IMF kind of kicking in with its uh, economic uh, restrictions. The Greek government, uh, you know, decided it wasn't going to respect uh, these human rights and rejected their demands. So about 40 days into this sort of hunger strike, these uh, Maghrebis, you know, also while the Arab Spring was in the background, 
um, were in a kind of a pre-comatose state. They were, uh, um, you know, they were within an inch of their lives, and um, you know, the the, the, the sense of um, or you know, radical organ failure uh, was 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 possible before you know, the Greek government actually decided to include them. And Spivak said the other night, uh, "We are bound by humanism." Well, I think you know, at a certain point, you know, we some people have to go to the very threshold of death before uh, they're granted their humanity, and um, and uh, it's kind of the essence of what Rousseau and Derrida uh, you know, were on about. You know, the essence of freedom is acting against this biological and social determinations in the name of a higher truth. So um, there's this philosopher called Alfonso Lingus who, who talks about the community that has nothing in common. Uh, not only do they have nothing in common, do they share nothing, but they have nothing, that nothing, uh, in common. Um, and it's what Costas Duzinas, um, you know? Costas Duzinas, who uh, works at Burbank College London called uh, uh, Politics at, at Degree Zero is the will to resist and the will that wills what does not exist. Okay, uh, well back to my friend, uh, the man with the, the drawer on his back. Um, it's a little bit like uh, like Lanfranco's turtle. Um, I, I like him as, as a figure and I actually have a picture of him up on the wall. Uh, there's something about him that I enjoy. I don't know what, you know, he's got a door on his back, like a shelter. Um, he's sitting on a sort of a, an edge, a cliff edge, staring into nothing maybe unable to plan or to scheme, a sort of vertiginous moment, and, um, you know, maybe waiting for some event to form itself in the teeth of what seems to be a fairly gloomy future. Um, is it, a, you know, it's sort of a combination of a, an image of defeat, but also of yearning, and it sort of seems a little bit, um, you know, interrogative. It asks questions for me that don't have answers. Uh, maybe it's part of that optimism of the will. I don't know, he's lifting his head up a little bit. Um, the artist is, is Charlie Dan, a Romanian who lives in Amsterdam, and um, so he's uh, come back from uh, you know a, a country a geography history perhaps that's been burnt back uh, to ground zero as well. There's something that's slightly comic about it, uh, uh, but there's also the sort of the weight and endurance of suffering on his back. And um, but while it's not, you know, we're talking about walls and, um, and borders, uh, this is a door, uh, doors that open and shut. And it allowed me to kind of meditate a little bit about doors. Um, I mean, who hasn't sat in a room staring at the inscrutable panels of door wait, waiting to see what's going to come through there? Maybe, you know, it's a job interview, maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe it's sort of the doctor with some kind of unpleasant results from an x-ray or whatever. Um, our fate often hinges uh, on, on but our fate revolves uh, on the hinges of the door. Um, and a door is a sort of a, a, a little right block in the everyday fact um, that uh, redis changes and redistributes human forces. Um, so uh, slam a door and it's a sign of weakness and gently shut a door it can be the most tragic gesture in life. And there's a certain kind of door shutting that will come to us all a quiet, sharp click that breaks the silence. Um, I like this photo too, it's, uh, we've got the information there uh, from Kinshasa. Uh, there's a sort of idea of the wall of fence as a sort of pastoral break perhaps, uh, an uncoupling from the marketplace, um, and there's a sort of outsider's angle on the, on the Avora, um, framed against the, uh, uh, apart from the normal flow of everyday life, um, and, uh, you know, from uh, Walden, uh, Josephine Bongo, uh, I also think of out there Mahmoud Darwish, who said, are, are we all martyrs, I whisper. Friends, leave one wall for the laundry line, a night for singing. Um, for me, that's, you know, that we, we need space, we need space for, for, for music, that we need the joy of creativity, even in the face of, 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 of uh, Unpleasantness. It also kind of rather focuses, uh, I guess, on, on the uh, on the uh, on the unity, on the individual and, and the multitude, uh, the politesse and the idiotes, I suppose. Um, but maybe maybe the music kind of uh, breaks that uh, divide. Um, um, I also think it sort of represents a kind of a that that wonderful uh, resistance, uh, almost mulish resistance that the artist has. 
um, um, to the everyday, you know, like a child playing in the sandpit, um, but with uh, with a, 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 a adult discipline guard. So it's a, a slightly the artist seeking a kind of autonomous space, a free space, maybe between the personal, okay, fine, okay, um, between the personal and the political. Um, okay. Uh, let me see. I've got five minutes. Um, I, uh, I, I I wanted to I know because uh, Sh uh, Shrich Shrichko's uh, talk was sort of dystopic. You know, it was gloomy, but it was incredibly fearless. Uh, and that's the great thing about intellectuals and artists who who face face the fears fearlessly. I think I think that's really great. But I, I also like to look at um, a, a little bit more inspiring. <laughs> Uh, stuff. Uh, um, one from Michel de Sarto, he says, culture is a battleground, but the battleground is unevenly occupied and treacherous. The mighty are never invulnerable, and the weak are never without hope. Uh, they're never without hope, and they're never without tricks. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, sort of talk a little bit about humor, the importance of humor, uh, and, and, and the artist's trickster. I noticed yesterday there was a little bit of mention uh, of the trickster. And in other words, the strength of the weak. And, um, and so let's uh, move on. Uh, this is a lovely work by an Iranian who lives in, in, in Sydney. Oh, no, in Adelaide, actually, in, Tech, in Australia. Hossein Balamanesh. And uh, we have empathy, sort of uh, walk, you know, we have an expression in English uh, to walk a, a mile in somebody else's shoes. Ah, uh, and uh, yes, the, the weakness of the, the weak, let's see, here we go. Uh, I'm a little bit out of order because I'm, I'm rushing a bit, but um, humor, I think. Um, Stalin said, happy people don't need humor. <laughs> I think uh, humorlessness is, is, is a big roadblock, and, uh, and you know, right across uh, the races and creeds and ideologies, there's lots of uh, humorless people. Um, I'd, as I said, I'd rather be a Groucho Marxist. Um, uh, I'd rather be a funny mentalist than a fundamentalist. <laughs> um, humor is, 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 of course, one of the weapons of the week. Uh, recently in Syria, uh, creativity and humor is used on many, many fronts. Uh, there was a sort of a, a pseudo um, a pseudo wedding created between um, a gas cylinder and a groom who was a, a dressed up diesel cylinder. It was sort of meant to be a joke on, on sort of the the lack of resources for, for, for partying. Um, other people sort of painted uh, pink, uh, ping pong balls with messages on them, you know, protest messages, and, 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 and went down from surrounding hills and, and threw them into, uh, into the city. There's messages of solidarity. I mean, there's a kind of likeness about that, but um, you know, something I like about it. Well, they left sort of MP3 players with, with, uh, in trash cans to blare resistant messages. Uh, they plastered uh, Bashar al-Assad's face on a pack of cigarettes, uh, or you know, warning about you know the Syrian regime will give you cancer, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I don't know if you saw the finger puppets of somebody called Ma Masasit Mati, the top boom group, and um, you can find them on YouTube. Uh, they little five-minute things uh, that lasted for a short time uh, because they were really taking uh, taking the Mickey out of. Uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad was, was given his name Bishu, which is a little baby name, and um, these were quick forming uh, mobile protests, and uh, there was a final episode, the 13th, in which uh, Bishu is telling the audit audience that he will not step down because the president and the people are one. But then he prevented them from leaving the stage, uh, but the, the, the human puppeteer who was wearing a mask said, no, you're not going anywhere, and, um, and, uh, and Bishu said, look, these are treasonable words. And the, the puppeteer control the, part, the puppet in order to show that the, the people, in a sense, uh, can control the president. But while he was doing this little show, or at the end of it rather, you know, he uh, he said, "Look, his closing said, this 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 is the easy part. Believe me, the more important and difficult step is to forgive each other and to build a free, civil, and democratic uh, Syria." And that was that was back in November 2011. Um, all right, the artist is Trickster. I think um, Greece has, uh, has got a famous one, Di Diogenes La Laesius, of course. You, you know the story about him being kidnapped by pirates in Aegina, and uh, he was taken to Crete and was going to be told that he was going to be sold as a slave. 
And uh, he says, what can you do? And he says, I can give orders. Uh, you know, sell me to somebody who's prepared to take orders. <laughs> um, and I, I think Ronald Dijonis, of course, is also the, you know, the first person who said, you know, I'm, I, I live beyond the, the Greek Empire. I'm a citizen of the world. Um, OK, uh, uh, an image from Australia. Uh, all our asylum seekers landing on the beach. Uh, there's the politics of art as well. I can think Greeks to take modern, says this Turkish guy. Uh, Francis Alice, who uh, got his people, two minutes, uh, uh, to move um, a, a sand dune, a border, four inches. These were volunteers, 500. Uh, he also put a fox in an art gallery. The trickster from Anonymous, very interesting, that sort of black and red. Ahmed Ergut, who, uh, who uh, <laughs> runs into places and uh, with a sign, this area is under 23 hour video and audio surveillance. <laughs> There's one hour when they're not watching, but which hour? Uh, and in, in the meantime, he sort of uh, transforms a car into a police. Uh, 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 Francis Ellis walking the green line. The guy who turns his uh, Kalashnikov into a guitar. <laughs> Somebody taking roadblocks, not very seriously. And uh, the great Zygmunt Spanusis, who uh, loves to take uh, take the piss, as we say in Australia, uh, out of everyone who uh, uh, worth listening to, uh, go there. Um, yes, uh, the trickster, you know, famously, he walks along um, a border, and he's wearing a red, one half red, one half black, and uh, he. You know, he creates this uh, argument between these two friends. You know, one who runs. You see the guy with the red hat. And he says, "What are you talking about? The guy had a black hat." Uh, no. And then, uh, and then, issue this character, this African uh, trickster guy, comes back and says, "Look, you know, I've got red and black." So it's kind of really about um, about uh, this uh, this need to uh, be double-sided to be able to see both sides. Okay. Well, let, let's leave it at that. And um, I had a lot more, um, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Interesting paper indeed. Uh, with much to much to think and uh, question and wonder about. Now uh, we have about uh, 15, 20 minutes of Q and A. Uh, I'm sure there's questions, comments, many questions is what we welcome. Not sure. So uh, please do go ahead. And whoever makes a uh, wants to make a question, there's a mic uh, around you know at the level of your knees. You know, if, okay, every couple of seats, so you can pick it up from. No. They're not. They're not working. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking because actually we were talking about that already. Before, like um, we had the parody on first uh, Friday, and uh, also today, basically when we started with the sex and the big bubble in the morning, <laughs> um, there was the part of. Um, Things don't become funny, really. I, 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 you know, I think it, it really is a, a factor. I'm, I'm always amazed at the, the way um, you know people can find uh, jokes as kind of safety valve somehow uh, for the grimmest. You know, I mean, they're often known as sick jokes. Um, I, I even heard a, a Middle Eastern guy make a joke about suicide bombs. Now, you, you wouldn't think that you could get a laugh out of it, but he said, like, "Okay, uh, suicide bomb. Uh, I can't, can, you, can you imagine a class?" Um, suicide Bombing 101. I'll only watch this because I'll only do it once. <laughs> There's a point at which you know you can laugh and then you know you gag and then you know you, you 
feel a little bit sick. Uh, it, it, it's 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 yeah, it, it's tricky, but it does shift, I, I suppose. Um, sometimes irony can insulate you, insulate yourself from caring. Um, sometimes it, it's you know really necessary that, that we do love. Um, in, in ancient Greek tragedies, they they always followed it. They always followed uh, a tragedy with, with a com comic lewd play, um, and uh, and likewise Elizabethans would uh, would have a tragedy and then they would have a, a, a jig, you know. And, and sort of it's kind of basically about um, the, the the pattern of death and rebirth, the need to find a return to to normalcy, you know, in the most terrific of circumstances. Yeah. It's sometimes slow, but if otherwise, just shout. No, <coughs> to make a really good question. Um, <laughs> well, then let's wait for the mic. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I have a question, but um, I'm just. I'm wondering loudly, you said that activists locate practice in organization yes. and artists in awareness. Yes. And I'm wondering uh, very loudly if, if you have a distinction between a worker and an activist, and also if there is a any, worker. A, worker, a worker and an activist, and if there is any if there is any relevance and any meaning in being an artist without being a worker or an uh, activist at the same time. And how how does it reflect in the art? Um, so you're asking me whether every artist should be an activist, or how could they not be an activist? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I guess some circumstances require it more than others. One of the dangers, I guess, just in, in terms of uh, uh, if if you have the good morality or if you have the good politics, you know, does it does it make good art? You know, like protest art. It, you know that, that's one of the difficult questions. Uh, on the one hand, from from the art scene, uh, but you know, um, I guess in, in terms of uh, states of emergency, then you know it clearly doesn't matter whether you're going to make a nice work or, or an ugly work. Uh, you know, it, it depends very much on the context. Um, but yeah, um, I, th I think there've been uneasy bedfellows uh, art, and partly it's got to do with the culture and maybe capitalist culture, which. When you open the newspapers, you know, all the headlines at the, the front, you know, and this is the serious part of the world, and then you've got the leisure pages, you know, which is where the art world lives, you know, and that's sort of <coughs> part of, you know, a kind of a life after, after the, you know, the rat race or the mouse race is over that you can enjoy. So there's that, there's that sort of binary thing that's established already. Um, but I think it was Raymond Williams who, who made that remark about activists, uh, you know, organised. And I don't know that, that it's... Uh, necessarily, um, you know, the, the role of the artist to, to, to be able to organise, but they can often, they seem to shed light in a kind of sideways manner, um, you know, rather than directly, you know, rather than being hit over the head with a, an ideological slogan, you know, until, you know, you know okay. Um, yeah, so, so I think there are different ways of, of attacking the problem. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a matter of gradation, I guess. I don't have any hard and fast rules about it, really. I think it was Raymond Williams who made that observation. Yeah. A little light. Here you go.
Yes. And it's sexually very relevant to your speech, and you said we must understand. Well, yeah, sometimes we're often caught, you know, on, on, on an issue, yeah, uh, between them. Have you got any comments on yourself? Have you got any questions about the, the, the hunger strikers? And uh, I, I mean, as Greeks, you know, yeah, I guess you experience things differently. Um, but the fact the fact was that they, they had been living for 10 years and working, and uh, it seemed to me that what it, it's kind of like a fable, you know, of where is the limit at which you know you kind of acknowledge the humanity of somebody else, you know, and. Uh, um, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's a slippery slope when you, you take the position of those who think, oh, you know, you know we, we project them as, as others, you know, who, who are, you know, who don't, don't have sort of the rights of, of anybody else. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, when you've got a bunch of hyenas around a dried up well, it's, uh, it's a, it does get pretty ugly, I guess. It's a kind of existentialist effect, I think. Uh, there, um, you know, life is unendurable, and yet, and yet we endure. Uh, it's true that it's such a big, you know, uh, thing to hang things on. But for me, it, it you know, it, it came at the time, uh, you know, from personal things in my life, but also, uh, you know, just just being bombarded by one kind of crisis after another. It simply wasn't that a crisis was an interruption to uh, to normal. Uh, life, uh, you know, we seem to be in a semi-permanent state of crisis, you know, financial or something. And, and so, yeah, and I just thought, oh, well, I, I can't go on, I go on. Um, and, and I like paradoxes, in a sense. I like, uh, I like the way in which, uh, I don't know, I don't really understand the Spivak's thing on the, on the bi binary and uh, the pathology of logocentrism and the rest of it, nor am I really interested, but um, I, I, I find uh, that kind of double bind, or that, that the way in which a contradiction uh, is given elbow room uh, in a paradox. That's what that's what I, I find interesting, just as a as a as a, as a conceptual framework. Um, yeah, I, I guess it can yeah, anybody can. Some right wing fucker can be you know being tortured. Yes, <laughs> go on, I'll go on. They can use that phrase. I'm using it in a particular <laughs> context here. <laughs> 